All right. So, good evening, everybody. And um, I've been using laser in my practice since December 2019, just before COVID took off. I'm going to say that it was a bit of a game changer. It certainly helped to broaden my toolbox and make it just a little bit easier to handle those complex cases that come through the door. So, it was a really, really good tool to add into the box because now I was in a situation where I could add um, treatment paradigms to include both the bony bits, the mechanical bits, the muscle bits, but also the integration between the two, the, the communication network that linked the brain to all these complex areas. So patients that were getting 70% better were suddenly getting um, a better positive outcome. So um, I've brought up this particular case history. Um, uh, her name is Julia. And without further ado, I'll just um, introduce her a little bit further down the line, meet the athlete. She's a previous previous uh, Great Britain Masters swimming record holder in the 50 meters breaststroke. She's a European and World Age Group triathlon qualifier. Uh, she's a top 10 finisher in the long course Ironman weekend in Wales. And at this point, I just want to point out that she also managed to win the ladies swim section outright. Now, what we didn't realize at the time was that carried a, um, a cash prize, which very kindly paid for accommodation that weekend. So we were thrilled to bits. Um, it's great fun. She's a, a passionate snowboarder, skier and kite surfer. And um, she's also my teammate in the sport of swim run, in which we qualified for the world champs in Sweden. So obviously I had a very strong vested interest to make sure that this athlete was working at an absolute optimum. Um, here we've got a wonderful picture of her standing on the podium at the Leeds Triathlon a few years ago. Uh, in that particular one, she qualified for the European Triathlon Union Championships. Um, it was a bit of a funny story because she'd withdrawn from that citing the expenses of traveling to the country and no sooner had she done that than I qualified so I had to have that awkward conversation with would you mind if I went and you didn't funny enough she said no and uh, I never got to experience that particular opportunity but it wasn't such a big deal anyway um, as you can see she's quite a dynamic athlete involved in a lot of very different types of sports revolving around high levels of uh, pro perception and coordination um, snowboarding in the uh, French Alps is always a tough thing so I'm just going to give you a bit of a background story on swim run. The idea originated in 2002 in Sweden. Uh, four friends got very drunk around a table, which as you can appreciate in Sweden is very, very expensive. Um, and they felt to chatting about how tough would it be to travel from the north side of an archipelago in the Baltic Sea, in a little town called Uto, traveling 46 miles or 75 kilometers all the way down south to a second little town called Sandheim. Obviously, the more they drunk, the uh, more they drunk, they, the easier the idea got. So they decided at the end of the day that uh, they would set up a challenge, two teams of two, and um, using human power alone, they swam and ran their way from Uto to Sandham, and the losing team had to pay for drinks and food that night. Now, obviously, with that sort of stuff being incredibly expensive in Sweden, it was a strong incentive for people to kind of make sure that they um, completed the race ahead of the other team. Anyway, the, the race ran for a few days and the concept got taken over by two gentlemen, Michael Lamel and Matt Scott in 2006. And they just took it, they fine-tuned it, they broadcast it, marketed it, and it's become a global phenomenon today, a little sporting activity that is available worldwide. It really is a truly impressive um, sport. Um, it involves, it involves an, um, a team of two. It's an adventure race and there's usually multiple legs of open water swimming and trail running. And the race is usually held in stunning locations with fairly wild scenery. Typically, one would run in a wetsuit and then obviously swim in your trail shoes. Now, that does kind of create some fairly unique challenges, and you do get some fairly wild stares from the, the local population as you run past. Um, in order to maintain good technique and form and also buoyancy in the water, quite often you'll use hand paddles, pull boys, and sometimes a tow float. Now, the, obviously, the swim, swim run challenges that you're exposed to you've got two very different racing environments. Um, you've obviously got to travel from a, an aquatic environment, which can be very cold, currents, uh, waves, salt water, fresh water, and so cold is, uh, is definitely a consideration there. Um, you've also got highly variable, variable running terrain. Um, you've got the nutrition and electrolyte consideration with anything that is an endurance style event, and you've got quick equipment to deal with, as we discussed previously, what that basically means is that you've got to kind of be able to handle this equipment as you transition from the running to the swimming and then back again. So in a nutshell, you need really strong endurance and fitness. You need great biomechanical function 
effective recovery strategies and top-notch balance and proprioception. Here we've got a picture of the sort of terrains that one has to deal with in terms of a swim run adventure. You've obviously got the, um, the cold water scenario and you've got the, um, the undulating terrain with much uh, little opportunities to sprain ankles and fall over and hit your head. And then obviously there's loads and loads of ups and downs. Now, if I could just introduce you to the patient here. Um, this is Julia. Um, she was a patient that was struggling with fatigue related to overtraining. Basically, it worked out to be a, a massive oxidative stress mechanism. Um, every time she did a training load, she wasn't very good at the active recovery side of things. She was complaining of chronic diverse pain involving multiple joints and dysfunctional kinematic change with, along the myofascial lines. Uh, she was struggling with subacogenic headaches, which you'll see a little bit later right, was posture related. And then more, quite interestingly, on long swims, she had paresthesia of the left hand, suggesting a probable thoracic outlet syndrome and or a carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, there is a reason for that, which I'll show you on the next slide. Hopefully, everybody can see it, of course. And then we had crepitus of the right shoulder, suggesting a dysfunctional scapulohumeral rhythm. She had a history of two fractures to the left wrist uh, incurred from snowboarding. So a really complex picture with a lot of problems, a lot of different areas. So it really fell out of the straightforward, just... Uh, try and treat the patient, you had to really think outside the box and, and blend together a whole lot of different options. So here we've got um, a clinical pain diagram. And you can see that on the right hand side, she had a pec scar tissue, which I'll just shine over there if you can see that. Um, basically what that was doing was creating sort of a, a lock mechanism that was disrupting the transverse myofascial chain. So she kept complaining of um, concurrent pain in the left iliotibial band. The two wrist fractures had restricted movement, which was then causing a dysfunctional kinematic chain up, the, up towards the elbow and the shoulder. She also had bilateral anterior inferior glenohumeral translation, anterior head carriage, which was restricting her thoracic capacity and affecting her breathing. Um, and then she had the classic myofascial trigger point syndrome on the right, upper trapezius, and levator scapulae. She had stiffness and tightness between the shoulder blades and, of course, concurrent lower back pain. So basically, a real bundle mixed bag. One of those patients that you love to see first thing on a Monday morning. Um, she stood with anterior head carriage with anterior inferior translation of the glenohumeral joint, worse on the right than left. She had that scar tissue that we spoke of, and basically the diagnosis of an upper and lower cross postural syndrome. She was definitely a thoracic breather, and you could quite clearly see um, um, the predominance of the uh, sternocleidal mastoids, the scalenes, and the intercostal muscle tissues. And there was an anterior dominance of core when we we're doing uh, functional muscle testing. We did a few functional muscle tests, um, the one-legged stalk test in balance, a full-legged squat, uh, the bird dog test on the bed, which basically showed us that there was a, a difficulty with uh, engaging the core in a symmetrical and even fashion, anteriorly, posteriorly, and uh, laterally. And we also got the impression of a sympathetic system dominance. So basically her entire lifestyle was all about getting locked in flight or fight, which is um, great in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term. Type of treatments that we'd infected with her. Uh, we had soft tissue therapy, um, laser therapy, obviously, which is of interest particularly tonight. Um, we were deactivating active myofascial trigger points by using dry needling with um, skin compression and following that up with PNF stretching and active release techniques. We're using standard chiropractic manipulation and mobilization techniques. And then um, I attended a seminar with Don Strachan and ended up walking away with a, a Grayston tool, which is like a little Swiss army knife that had a whole lot of different. Um, edges to it, which would allow you to do my fascial release techniques through various different areas. So a really useful tool that kinesio taping, which I think is absolutely fantastic for active recovery and support. And then we used a home-based functional strength rehabilitation program, which was targeted specifically at swimming and running. Um, I used Jay Jacheri and Mike Antonides uh, from the running school in London. Jay Jacheri is a strength and conditioning coach in America. They have a strong interest in running specific drills, form drills, neurological interaction with the, the muscle systems. Really, really fantastic stuff. And when we started to incorporate the lazy, we got some tremendous results out of Julia, which was uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, really, really got that whole scenario going well and got everything integrated. So the goals of treatment with Julia were trying to improve energy and stamina, um, optimize the balance and proprioception for an unstable, unpredictable terrain, definitely improve posture, which would aid in breathing, uh, improved functional strength with less pain and crepitus. Pain generally tends to cause weakness and dysfunction. 
Um, and obviously the crab just let us know that there was um, a real issue with the, uh, the shoulder girdle on the right side, which is not great when you're swimming an incredibly long distance. Uh, improved breathing function and optimized recovery strategies. Now, the Hawkeyes amongst you will notice that most of them have been highlighted with the question mark of the laser. We can pretty much use those or integrate them into those particular um, goals of treatment. Um, so, as I said, the, the laser was a bit of a game changer as we went along. What exactly is laser? Uh, I'm going to whiz through this because I presume that most people that are watching this seminar have some interest already. Um, it's light application by stimulated emission radiation. Um, it's a low intensity light therapy. Uh, I have the EVRL, which has two dual diodes, which is a category two laser. So it doesn't deliver enough energy to create a thermal reaction. Um, if you belong to the British Chiropractic Association, uh, they sent out an email about changing the insurance policy to accommodate a category four laser. Now, obviously that has a slightly different application. Uh, you don't need to worry about that with this category two lasers that are currently provide. They are the industry leading standard, as far as I'm aware. The um, laser, it's a process of photobiomodulation, where you're shining a high energy light beam onto the tissues. The tissues absorb that, uh, and it elicits a positive biological response. It triggers, um, triggers biomechanical changes within the cellular structure, and this can be compared to sort of the process of photosynthesis with a plant. So whenever I use the laser on a patient, I generally tend to introduce it as, when I use the EVRL laser, I get you to photosynthesize to increase your energy so that you can work better and longer. We also try and defrag and reboot your computer, much like we should have done tonight to make this uh, webinar work a bit more accurately. That makes it, your body work quicker and more accurately. So a really, really cool tool to use. Uh, the effects of laser, uh, rapid cell growth, uh, faster wound healing, increased metabolic activity. It reduces fibrous tissue formation and it has an anti-inflammatory action, increased vascular activity, stimulated nerve function, stem cells to help repair, healthy immune response, emulsification of fats within cells. This was pertinent for Julia for everything except for the last one, because A, I don't have the emerald light, which emulsifies the fat, and B, she doesn't have much fat to emulsify, so we really didn't need that as a concentration, a consideration at this point. The rest of the stuff I think you're probably all familiar with. So the, uh, the difference between the red diode and the violet diode, aside from the wavelength, uh, red is 635 nanometers, Violet is 405. Um, the red tends to balance the parasympathetic nervous system and that enhances the microcirculation of the blood vessels and the lymph nodes or the lymph system. It has an anti-inflammatory effect, stimulates energy production within the mitochondria and it enhances the ATP production and protein synthesis with pain reduction, which was particularly pertinent for Julia because she was struggling with pain in a lot of different areas. Modulates energy levels reduces pain and muscle spasm while increasing strength and range of motion, improves collagen formation and wound healing, and balances cell-to-cell -cell communication, basically getting the job, doing the job in trying to get the body to function as absolute optimum. The violet uh, light stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. It's antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal, has a greater response to immune function, and it works in a shorter time frame. Now, the interesting thing it can also do is it can help to unlock a hidden condition. So if you shine the violet light on a muscle, which then suddenly makes it decide to go weak, it generally tells you that that muscle might be work operating in a sympathetic state, i.e. it's getting overstimulated. If you then stimulate an overstimulated muscle, it'll generally tend to blow out on you, in which case, if you are then doing a muscle check either before or after, um, you can use that to try and affect whether or not you've created a difference with your treatment. So I would potentially treat, say, shoulder. I might um, use a, an activator on a chromoclavicular joint. If the coracobrachialis blows out, then I know I need to make, potentially use the red violet laser just to try and rebalance that particular situation. So it's, it's quite a good detective. Uh, it's Dr. Silverman's choice of wavelength for stimulating the vagus nerve, which is quite important in the laser world. Um, he says it's to do with the heart rate variability in being increased when you use the violet beret rather than the red, lay, red light. Um, when I do the violet, uh, the Vegas protocol, I generally tend to use a combination of both the, um, the red and the violet, but at separate times and in different areas, and then uh, combine the two in the, in the cerebellum area. Um, a small little anecdotal detour. This is my daughter who just recently suffered from um, chickenpox. Um, she had a poor little mite. She was absolutely covered in spots and very, very distressed and uncomfortable, itchy, hot, restless, and really sleeping badly. Um, interestingly, she fell ill roughly the same time as one of her friends. And what we decided to do was to 
to use the EVRL on the acne setting, which was the, the violet light alone, for about 10 minutes, three times a day, and basically just covered her body in the violet break, because again, it's antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungicidal. And um, within 12 to 24 hours of doing that, she was a lot more rested, slept really, really well that night, and made a speedy, speedy recovery, far quicker than a friend. And on a little detour as well, she had some verrucas on her feet, which I used the violet light on. So I've had some really, really good um, treatment to sites um, with this particular laser unit, the EVRL. I recommend it highly. So getting back to the vagus nerve, it's the uh, 10th cranial nerve. It's called the Wanderer. Uh, and it originates in the medulla oblongata, comes out through the jugular foramen, and it has innovations involving the auricular area, uh, it stimulates the larynx, pharynx, and the tongue, and then it'll disappear down to the thorax where it has communication networks with the heart, the lungs, and also the gastrointestinal system. It's a really interesting nerve though, because it's a mixed spinal nerve, and it's got 90% afferent sending information through to the brain and 10% efferent going down. So it's basically a great big, enormous super highway going from the brain down to the, uh, the abdominal back, they're talking to one another all the time. So if you have any form of therapy that can have an impact on that particular vagus nerve, then you're gonna, you've got a game changer there. If you can optimize that function, it can have some dramatic effects on your overall homeostasis. Uh, so in terms of the vagus sequence, uh, the EVRL, put it onto the acne setting, and what you ultimately do is sweep, sweep the lateral chest bilaterally. Normally do that for about a minute, um, both sides, and then I would change it from the red, sorry, the, uh, the violet setting to the red and violet setting, and I would concentrate on the right low abdomen, switching across the jugular foramen, and then covering the auricular area. If I have a bit of time later, I might be able to demonstrate on my lofty and expensive subject behind me, wearing the mask and the, uh, the face shield. But if not, then potentially at a, another seminar further down the line, we can kind of go through a practical demonstration of a lot of these ideas. Frequency 10, 10, 10, and 10, which is very easy to program into your, uh, your module. So the laser protocols, I generally tend to follow a specific sequence. Um, the easiest and simplest way, when in doubt, just point and shoot. Uh, the static position of the patient and the laser the body will absorb the laser photons and it will create a biological effect. Your body knows what it needs to do. If you walk into the sun, you will absorb the sunlight, you will create vitamin D and you will operate more, more comfortably. You don't have to tell your body how to do it, it happens all by itself. It's likewise with the laser. The second module would be the passive. This is where I would move the affected structure. So um, in Julia's case with the fractured wrist, I was using the EVRL specifically on the left wrist itself um, statically first and then I moved into the passive where I would take it through its full range of motion and then um, I would move into the active scenario where the patient would move the body part and I would just move the laser of the area. What I do tend to do with the passive and the active which I do as a tip here, follow the dermatoma line from the site of interest up the area and through to the midline, in this case up the shoulder into the neck and then towards the brain area. What you're then doing is using the laser to stimulate that power cord network from the site of interest all the way through the brain and you're optimizing that particular function. That for me was a real, real game changer. Um, and then lastly, I sometimes included a bit of resistant isometric contraction if I just wanted to kind of power up the muscle as it were. It's a little bit like activating the muscles before you go for a run. Um, obviously just you're adding the laser to do that, which I thought was quite a, an interesting concept. Um, the laser locomotor lock and I got from Dr. Silverman. And his word, he says, it resets the neuromuscular skeletal system in 3D and facilitates global interaction. Now, we've got to bear in mind that swim run, triathlon, cycling, running, swimming, it's, it's, they're all dynamic sports and involve a lot of movement. So what we wanted to do with the laser is we wanted to kind of create those sort of scenarios, laser the patient while they're going through sort of a movement process, which would recreate what they do in the, in the actual race conditions. Um, so I was a real, real fan of that particular scenario. Um, he describes laser lock-in, basically uh, start off with five seconds, eyes open, then eyes closed. You're going to do a cross crawl because we're contralateral creatures, so with things like running, um, it's right arm forward, left leg back, and that cross contralateral mechanism is, is something we need to be aware of. Aim to the posterior midline of the spine, try and get the vital light over the spinal cord, and then red over the adjacent nerve roots, and you use both red and violet over the light cerebellum. Um, so a really, really a little handy tool, but you can use that shoulders, elbows, you can use that um, lower back, neck, 
Uh, he's got a really good shoulder protocol that he showed us at the demonstration. Um, so to my mind, chiropractics and using a laser, there's a, a science and an art to it. The science will tell me what it can do, but the art tells me how I can do that. So with Julia racing in those kind of environments, we want to create dynamic movement that mimics the race conditions. So we start to use unstable platforms like wobble balls, wobble boards and balls. We also got her to sort of do like plyometric exercises, get her to jump onto a single leg, basically try and recreate those sort of platforms, you know, sort of um, doing lunges in sort of like a clock pattern from one o'clock to two o'clock to three o'clock, et cetera. So basically just trying to shift the balance into a lot of different ways while we actually stimulate it with the laser. That, that really worked well in her case. Uh, we use resistance banding with swimming drills. And then going back to Mike Antionides from the running school, he's got a fantastic mat where he's got a whole pattern of um, footprints on a, um, a pad which you can actually follow and use to create certain type of movement patterns, uh, which you can then kind of reinforce um, reinforce dynamic movement. So it's really, really good for injured runners coming back from um, a dark place to, to full function. Uh, the frequency settings, this are actually nicked from Econi itself. So it should be freely available, I presume. Uh, but basically what they do is they give you um, some protocol that you would use in terms of frequency settings from acute to subacute getting up to optimum wellness and performance, and then some additional settings, chronic nerve brain and gut. If anybody's interested in this, I'm pretty sure if you get in touch with either Vanessa or Kate, they'd be able to put you in the right direction. Um, this is the one that I tended to use quite regularly. I've pre-programmed this into my EVRL. It's got all the, um, the frequencies from Dr. Silverman's top, most, top eight most used uh, protocols. So it's nice, it's already there. If I have a patient coming in with a specific type of injury, other chronic scar tissue, which is pertinent in Julia's case, or brain injury, just bring it up, hit the mode, and find out the one that's pertinent to that one. So that allows me to use the laser at its best. And then we moved on to nutrition. And now a lot of credit here has to go to Lila Charlesworth. She's a PhD student at the Leeds Beckett University, and she gave us a wonderful presentation on nutrition and its impact with inflammation. This was to the West Yorkshire Chiropractice Practice Group. Uh, this was a Zoom presentation back in 27th of January, I think it was 2021. Um, and also I took some detail from uh, Doctor's Kitchen, uh, Rupi Orji. He had a wonderful um, post that I used. So in Julia's case, uh, Julia was struggling with food intake during the longer events. Um, she had this amazing metabolism that allowed her to, to um, cover incredible distances with very, very little um, input. She didn't really feel a strong urge to refuel, so we had to actually almost teach her to take that a bit more seriously. And she got, certainly got caught out in the Isoman triathlon a few years ago, where she neglected electrolytes during a hot and humid day and actually went into a global cramp and ended up in the hospital tent. She did finish third overall, um, but I think that the half an hour that um, she spent in the tent meant she missed the prize giving, so I had to go up and accept the prize on her behalf, which was um, less than popular. Um, I've included the uh, website, so if anybody's interested in it, there are other nutritional aids available out there. Um, this is just the one that we found was the best for her. Basically what they do is they take a sweat test or they get you to do an online questionnaire which puts you into a specific category and then they tell you make one of three different types of um, strengths for precision fuel and hydration in, a, in order to optimize your electrolyte. They recommend that you take a sachet before a race and then drip feed during a race if you're in a position to be able to do so. The second product that we found very, very useful was called UCAN, which was basically a complex carbohydrate which had been specifically heat treated in a way to create a uh, structure which provided a very, very slow, steady release of energy into the system without those horrible sugar spikes that you tended to get with a lot of the more conventional gels. Basically what it did is if you combine the gels during the race, that will give you the spike if you need it. But if you take a UCAN beforehand, it drips through the system really, really nice and slowly. So fantastic product. Once again, there are other products out there um, which are available for, for you to consider. Uh, and then of course, there's increased water intake as a general life habit. She was complaining about headaches. So we got her to increase the water intake, um, suggesting that she actually took on water as soon as she woke up first thing in the morning because she didn't seem to forget otherwise. But it's one of those things that there are a lot of biological processes going on through the evening and if you tend to neglect them, they will catch you out and your body will still function, but not necessarily at its best. 
So we've got a slide here, which may not come up as clearly as that I was like, but um, if anybody's interested in the notes afterwards, please contact either Kate or get in touch with me via the Econia group. But basically, it's a, an age-old concept. Everybody talks about the Mediterranean diet. Now, the Mediterranean diet, in actual fact, is not as specific to a location. It's just a concept whereby you are encouraged to eat a, a huge diversity of fruits and vegetables on a regular basis. Um, you're encouraged to have whole processed, uh, unprocessed foods, uh, which will allow you to derive um, a whole lot of components from a variety of different sources that have a positive benefit. So if you take a look at the, um, the little slide on the bottom right-hand corner, basically what uh, that does, it kind of gives you various different compounds which have certain types of benefits for, for optimum health. If you look at the food chart on the left, you've got the foods in the center, it tells you what compounds they contain, um, and it contains the benefits, and then also examples of what you can actually take on board. So basically in a nutshell, with this slide, what it's telling you is try and increase the diversity, because by doing so, what you're going to do is you're going to create a gut biome which will, um, it's a symbiotic relationship with trillions of different types of bacteria in your gastrointestinal unit. We feed the um, fiber and roughage to the gut biome and the gut, gut biome produces components which we aren't able to produce ourselves, so short chain fatty acids that then feeds into the system which then allows us to benefit. So we feed the gut biome, the gut biome feeds us. So that's a really, really cool little relationship to have. Um, Pro-inflammatory foods, this is probably fairly common knowledge. Refined carbohydrates like the cakes, the biscuits, you know, all the stuff that tastes really, really nice and it's probably highly addictive. Um, basically, we are, it's not that I would say necessarily eliminate them completely, but if you're in a position to be able to reduce them, that just allows you to um, uh, keep those, perhaps the, uh, the mild inflammatory reactions to, to a minimum. Processed meats, uh, processed fats, the trans fats that allow a cookie to live in a, a vending machine for six months, that's never going to be a good thing. And obviously, excessive alcohol not only does have a negative impact on sleep, but it's empty calories, um, which um, may create sugar spikes. Um, so it's just a, a biomechanical, uh, sorry, a, uh, a biological stress on the body that your body just doesn't need in a in a complex modern age, particularly with uh, COVID having to come out of that. So the antioxidants approach, basically, in Julia's case, we got her to choose fiber-rich foods to feed the gut biome. We encouraged her to cook meals from scratch. The, the more from scratch that you cook, the less processed it's likely to be, the greater the biological benefit, and also the ingredients are likely to retain the good compounds that feed our body. There's a wide range of different colored fruits and vegetables. The greater the diversity, the greater the benefit. Use a broad range of herbs and spices because each one contains a slightly different benefit to us. Use a broad range of legumes, nuts, and seeds. And then here, interestingly, um, Using fermented foods and probiotics to introduce a uh, bacteria or a strain of bacteria into the system just to reinforce what you already have. So food types like kefir, yakult, activia, kombucha, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, etc. Um, the one difficulty that you've got with probiotics, a lot of the products have a small amount of bacteria to introduce into the system. And you've got to bear in mind that your gut perm biome is made of trillions of different strains. So you might be introducing a teaspoon into the system, but Having said that, um, something is better than nothing at all. And also you need to make sure that it's in a compound that will survive the gastrointestinal tract. You've got to get it through into the um, into the intestine uh, via the stomach first. Um, so Martin's gold rules with respect to nutrition. If you can, try and replace processed foods and ultra-processed foods with unprocessed and minimally processed foods. Basically my catchphrase for Monday to tell the patient, if the food doesn't go bad, it's probably not going to be good for you. The World Health Organization set out a game plan for um, feeding the world, really, and they suggested, I think it was last year, try and reduce the frequency of meat consumption. Now, I was raised in South Africa, and South Africa, those guys like to eat meat. There's just no two ways about it. So the vegetarian equivalent would be a chicken on a plate, and salad is just really garnish. So um, with that in mind, we watched that wonderful documentary on Netflix called Game Changer, and it basically gave us the incentive to try and reduce the meat consumption in line with the World Health Organization. I would say that we eliminated it because we did appreciate that a good quality meat source does encourage a good protein source with all the amino acids required for our body to function at the optimum. 
But um, what we did was we kept eating meat on the weekend and we just did uh, fruit and veg through the, the week. Um, and that seems to have had some positive impacts, certainly in terms of health function and general life quality. Next one, if you can't pronounce an ingredient, it's probably going to be bad for you. And anything that's got E, the letter E in it and a whole bunch of numbers afterwards, is probably uh, not the best uh, dietary choice to have as, um, as a frequent choice. Try to cook from scratch and then try and choose foods that resemble their form and nature. Going back to eat the rainbow, use a variety of herbs, spices, try and use fermented foods um, or anything of that nature. Use supplements only if you can't derive the nutrients from whole food sources. I think if you are actually putting the body under huge mechanical stress and strain, using supplements is okay, but um, obviously eating it from a whole food source, that just allows you to use it in a, a more normal fashion. It's in a position where it can be absorbed quite easily and naturally by your body. Now, this was a topic that I got really excited about. Um, I didn't realize the overall impact that um, breathing would have on your, your global health and function. So I got into reading The Oxygen Advantage by Patrick Cowan, which I highly recommend. The Wim Hof Method, this is the Iceman from Holland. He is quite a, an interesting character, and I think he's on TV at the moment with a series where he takes celebrities and gets them to do various different types of mindfulness exercises, um, ice baths, and breathing techniques. Um, and then on my list is another book by a gentleman called James Nestor called Breathe. Uh, he's a journalist, but he's taken a scientific approach and he's tried to work out the science behind breathing and different techniques. So I'd certainly like to take a look at those in a little bit more detail. I think there's a tremendous value in that. Um, why did I look at breathing? Well, everybody breathes, but the question we've got to ask ourselves is, do we breathe well? And do we breathe in a way that allows us to enjoy optimum health? Uh, can we optimize our recovery when we're going through a high load training program where there's a massive oxidative stress on the body? Um, can we breathe for optimum adaption in order for us to kind of recover from those sort of stimuli? And then finally, can we try and build an athlete that functions at a peak and is, and res is resilient? Now, a resilient athlete is one, and that's a word that I like to use. Um, it's, it's funny how this athletes are able to kind of reach these in, in amazing heights. If you looked at the Ironman World Championships in St. George over the weekend, um, quite a few of those guys are operating on the fine line, and it's amazing how many of them broke down literally just before they got to the edge. And these guys are professionals, so when you're dealing with something like Julia, um, obviously we need to, to be mindful of the fact that recovery is, is hugely, hugely important. Um, basically, some important concepts with breathing. The Bohr effect. Now, this is one that I found quite interesting and one that I wanted to highlight. It came about from a Danish physiology, physiologist called Niels Bohr back in 1904. And basically, the Bohr effect describes hemoglobin's low affinity um, for oxygen secondary to increases in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and or decrease in the pH of the blood. Now, if you have an increase in carbon dioxide, the way in which it metabolizes within the, uh, the blood system, it will actually cause a decrease in the pH. So when you increase the carbon dioxide, what effectively happens is that the infinity for the hemoglobin and the oxygen decreases, so it increases the unloading of the oxygen into the tissues to meet the oxygen demands of that tissue. So basically, when you're an athlete and you have a high oxygen demand, if you have an irregular breathing pattern and you have a low carbon dioxide level relative to oxygen, then obviously there's less of an incentive for you to deliver that oxygen within your body to the tissues so you get impaired performance. So with that in mind, we had the BOLT test, which was introduced by Patrick Cowan. It's the body oxygen level test. It's basically an assessment tool. And basically what he does is he gets you to take a gentle breath in and then he gets you to gently exhale. And then once you fully exhale, you pinch your nose and then you time yourself to see how soon do you feel that first sensation of breathlessness, that urge to breathe. What this test does, it helps to develop the relative sensitivity um, to oxygen volume during rest and breathlessness. It gives us an indication of how well is your body functioning um, at this particular point in time. So it's a, it's a measurement tool which we can use, which can gauge not only your start point, but also your finish point as you progress through the treatment. So the BOL test was very, very interesting with Julia because as we use the later pros, laser protocols, the BOL test improved quite dramatically. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Now, the next concept is the hormetic stress. 
a prolonged stressful exposure of the body can have a harmful effect at high doses, but a low controlled dose can actually make a change in your body that makes us healthier and stronger. Now, this is a really interesting one. And I try to encourage Julia into trying cold showers um, to increase the resilience of the patient, but she was having absolutely none of it. Anyway, um, hormetic stress, you could look at things like intermittent fasting, doing something like a 16 and 8, where you eat within an eight hour time frame, heat and cold exposure, as Wim Hof would do, and then obviously the controlled hypoxia, which is a range of breathing exercises that uh, Patrick McCown was advocating in his book. Um, but basically, with hormetic stress, what you're trying to do is you're trying to introduce your body into a stressful environment in a controlled circumstance, which increases your, your parameters for tolerating that stress. So within an athletic environment, if you've got a broader paradigm to kind of handle those stress and strains, your body's not going to break down and go into panic mode. Uh, it basically makes you more resilient. Uh, the next concept, nitric oxide. This was a real interesting one for me. Um, basically, my wife would seem to suggest that I snore from time to time and occasionally I'd wake up with a brain fog and a dry mouth and I'm pretty convinced I don't. I'm sure she's just having me on. But anyway, the, the dry mouth and the, the fog uh, definitely sometimes happened. But the nitric oxide is generally produced in your nasal sinuses. So if you nasal breathe, what happens is the nitric oxide gets taken in with the uh, the air that you breathe in and then deep into the lung tissue and it, it, the nitric oxide is the first line of defense against pathogens so it's basically a filter it reduces the blood pressure because the nitric oxide will cause the blood vessels to vasodilate uh, and then which allows easier delivery of, of the oxygen um, to the tissues that are requiring it so the nitric oxide improves your gas regulation by increasing your oxygen delivery to the tissues. And that I thought was, was fascinating. So I've really become a big component of nitric oxide nasal breathing for that purpose. To the point where sometimes I'll try and tap up my mouth and go for a, uh, when, when I'm at home being uh, generally active, because uh, it basically will encourage me to, to kind of use that breathing pathway. So Secondly, the, uh, the VO2 max, now this refers to the maximum amount of oxygen that your body can use during exercise, and it measures the milliliters, the, the number of, uh, the milliliters of oxygen consumed in one minute per kilogram of body weight. Again, it's a measurement parameter of how fit and active are you um, in terms of being able to uh, be active over a prolonged period of time. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. So now in Julia's case, the bolt score that we referred to, she had one of less than 20 seconds. Now, according to Patrick McCown, Typically, one would hope that a, an athlete would be able to hit closer to 35 to 40 seconds. When I first started with these breathing exercises in the Oxygen Advantage book, um, I started off with 20 seconds as well, and I've managed to build it up to 35 seconds. So I can inhale and then exhale. And before I feel the, the urge to breathe, I can generally hold it for around about 35 seconds now, which is closer to the optimum. Um, we're working with Julie at the moment, and we are combining the laser technique with that. Uh, to try and optimize that. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about how the laser, laser integrates with the breathing a little bit further down the line. Julia had an increased respiration rate, which generally tends to um, decrease the carbon dioxide, increase the oxygen, but unfortunately makes that more difficult to deliver the oxygen to the tissues. She was definitely a thoracic breather, um, as we picked up on her examination. Um, using the secondary accessory muscles, so that, that dysfunctional pattern of breathing. When you're getting to high intensity exercise, um, you know, you're going to start using thoracic breathing anyway, that's inevitable. But when you're using sort of like a medium dose of exercise, um, you know, trying to incorporate diaphragmatic breathing is far more efficient uh, for the body and takes a lot less effort. Uh, her anterior head carriage and anterior inferior glenohumeral translation bilaterally was closing down the vital capacity of her breathing and restricting that pattern as well. So there's a few things that we needed to kind of work on. Um, in Julia's case. So the Oxygen Advantage program, basically a series of exercises that he advocates um, and we use with Julia, helps to improve the sleep and energy. There's easier breathing mechanism with reduced breathlessness during exercise, very important with the kind of sports that she was doing. Um, if you're kind of creating a controlled hypoxic reaction in the body, your body will react by increasing your red blood cells. So this could be as simple as going for a walk and holding your breath and walking for X number of paces before you start to breathe again and trying to kind of keep a controlled breathing rhythm. Um, it's a little bit like stimulating altitude training, but at a um, Yorkshire level. Um, so she was, 
it naturally increases the production of EPO in response to controlled hypoxic states, uh, but it's a little bit like doing altitude training, so that optimizes um, her particular performance further down the line. Um, there was improved oxygenation of working muscles and organs, reduction of lactic acid buildup and fatigue, so basically it delays the fatigue, you can perform better for longer, and then obviously we're getting onto things like improved running economy and VO2 max, because you're not losing form by gasping and spluttering and desperately trying to keep up. And then obviously the improved aerobic and anaerobic performance. Um, so it obviously hits the low intensity um, exercise as well as the high intensity exercise. So the changes that we introduced to, to Julia, we started off with a rectangular pattern of breathing to try and stimulate the parasympathetic system in her case. And this was picked up by Lawrence Van Lingen. He's quite a well-known chiropractor in America who works with high-end triathletes primarily. Basically, he advocates um, breathing in for four seconds through the nose, holding for two seconds, and then breathing out for six seconds. And this is recognized as being something that primarily stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, calms everything down. If you combine this breathing pattern with laser treatment using the Vegas protocol, um, that it just highlights the benefits even, even further. Secondly, when you kind of use the, the laser lights over the, the lung area and then kind of follow that up in towards the central midline system and up into the brain, um, in her case, what I did was I actually got her to uh, protect eyes with the goggles, or close the eyes, and I shine the light into the, uh, into the mouth, into the uh, palate, up the nose. Uh, and basically what we're trying to do there is hit the problem area from a lot of different angles. So we use the laser to optimize and just add that little extra 20% to the rectangular breathing, which is very powerful in its own right. Uh, we got encouraged her to do the nasal breathing to prove the use of the nitric oxide and all the benefits that go with nasal breathing, the, um, the filter mechanism, the humidifying the air, preparing the air for um, medium um, within the lungs, which allows it to be absorbed just that little better. Uh, we got her to try and adopt a breathe light and slower pattern of breathing, which improved overall oxygenation via the bore effect that we described a little bit earlier. Um, we got her to start swimming hypoxic sweat sets. She's a swim coach, so this was quite easy. But basically what we did is we got her to start swimming less um, length of the pool, where she did uh, breathing every three strokes. And then we should progress to five strokes, to seven, and then to nine. And trust me, when you're starting to get to nine strokes of breathing, you really start to struggle. With the running, we got it to try and incorporate nasal breathing for certain short spells. It looked like a fight leg session where you run fast. What we did is we got it to run at a certain intensity and then slow down the intensity, but do the nasal breathing instead. Again, what we're doing is we do like a, um, a controlled hypoxic stimulus or hermetic stress to the body, which would then allow your body to adapt and get stronger. It's a little bit like going into gym and building up your muscles. Um, and then we encouraged diaphragmatic breathing where we try and lead with the abdomen and feel for lateral expansion of the rib cage. This is something strongly advocated by Professor Pavel Kovel, Kohler, Pavel Kohler uh, in the Dynamic Neuromuscular Stimulation series, which I did a few years ago. So that was quite useful in trying to optimize movement patterns to unravel old injuries and get you to work in a more smooth, synchronistic fashion. Um, sleep. I'll just quickly whiz through this quite carefully because we've only got about five minutes left. Um, so I got this from a podcast with uh, Rangan Chatterjee where he interviewed Professor Matthew Walker. And it was a very long detailed one which you can actually do for yourself. There is a reference here if you're interested. But basically what they did is they took five factors with sleep which would optimize your recovery and your adaption and maximize your overall function. The first one is your body likes regularity. It's a real, it's a real fan of, of a habit. So if you're going through a certain kind of a ritual before you start to wind down and get ready for bed, um, then basically your, your body will start to, to um, produce the hormones required for you to go through into that, that um, the, sorry, the hormone, the melatonin, uh, which would like to prepare you for, for self asleep. Um, like I said, he encourages the wind down period before you get to bed, which prepares your body for rest. Your body starts to anticipate it. Um, he mentions that you should regulate the temperature within your room. And a perfect ideal, you'd be looking at uh, about 18 degrees centigrade. Um, if it's too hot, then you get hot and bothered and restless. I don't know if you've ever tried to fall asleep on, on holiday in a hot and humid climate. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. 
you don't get a really good quality sleep. But anything that allows you to dip from your rapid eye movement sleep, your REM sleep, into those deeper movements where your body kind of discharges all its toxins that's built up through the day. Uh, the REM sleep will kind of deal with uh, emotional rebooting. Um, so those are all fairly important concepts. Um, in terms of darkness, he, he tied that in with um, your, your sleep ritual or winding down ritual. He basically said, start to dim the lights about an hour before you, you start getting ready for bed. Maybe switch off the overlight or if you have a dimmer switch, turn it down so that basically it stimulates that getting dark process that we have on a primitive level. Um, and basically in doing so, that ensures that when you do get into bed, your body's ready for sleep and you drop off quickly and you enjoy that good quality sleep. So obviously in Julia's case, with her being a high-profile athlete, we needed to ensure that sleep was optimum for adaption, recovery, and function the following day. If you are struggling to sleep, then he suggests walk it out. What that basically means is get out of the bed, try and avoid associating bed with an area where you toss and turn and wrestle with the concept of trying to sleep. So um, get up, get out of bed, go into a room, don't switch on anything with the blue light on it because obviously that's, that's, that's useless. Um, looking at your phone at three o'clock in the morning is not going to stimulate um, any form of sleep for you. Avoid any bright lights, have sort of a dim light, maybe do a bit of quiet reading until you feel ready for bed, get back into bed and then just fall asleep and that should allow you to optimize. And then in terms of intake, here we're talking, to, um, talking about things like caffeine and alcohol. Caffeine has a quarter life of 12 hours. So if you have a cup of coffee at six o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the evening, you've still got a quarter of that caffeine left in your system. And some people are far more sensitive to than, uh, than, than others. So basically in a nutshell, what we want to do there is either move across to things like a decaf tea or coffee, or if you want to get fancy, try and blend a decaf with the calf so that you get that wonderful taste and that small hit, but you want to kind of control the caffeine levels so that you don't find it difficult to get to bed. Uh, I generally tend not to have any coffee uh, or caffeine after 12 o'clock midday because I just tend to find that makes me too jittery and I find it very difficult to kind of wind down. And then finally, the um, alcohol, yes, it is a depressant and some people think that it will give you a good night's quality sleep, but what it does, it tends to fragment your sleep and it disrupts your, um, your rapid eye movement protocol, which then prevents you from um, emotional rebooting. So the following day you might make up, wake up, the following day your, your frontal cortex will allow you to make some pretty dark decisions. Um, so sleep, there's a, a huge body of, um, of stuff there that I'm still going to be researching. I'm still going to be looking to uh, ways to which we can optimize that. Um, so as I progress with that, I might get back and give you a bit more information further down the line if that's of interest. So in terms of these protocols, if you finally get it all right, what happens? There's a wonderful picture here that speaks of a thousand words. You get a picture of me trudging up a hill absolutely goosed. And if you just look in the top right hand corner, there's a little red head with a huge broad grin on the face where she dusted me up the hills and she was super strong on that. So what that told me is that I needed to take a hold of my own advice. Um, with the end result that I too can function at her particular level. But I hate to admit it, I think she's actually a better quality athlete than I am. So um, the triumph story for my partner in crime in swim run was that uh, we managed to complete that world championship and she put in a stunning performance and I realized that I had a little more to work on. So I'm taking a bit of my own medicine. All right, a few little references and sources here. And then I just had a upper cross postural syndrome and a low cross postural system to, to refer to, but I think you guys are probably familiar with that already. So that draws the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, my presentation to a close. Uh, I just wanted to apologize again for the small technical difficulty that we had at the beginning. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that it is now 7.30, so I hope you find a bit of value in that and how to integrate the laser into the system. I think what I would potentially consider doing is coming up with another presentation where we actually go through practical, practical uh, applications, maybe do a video clip. So if that's of interest, um, Kony can no doubt get back in touch with me, but I hope the theory gave you something to think about. Uh, I use the EVRL and I found that to be an absolute game changer, just in optimizing that last little 10 to 15%, which allows the patient to, to operate at their fullest potential. And as you can see from that last photograph that I brought up, it really does tend to, uh, make me uh, have to work hard to keep up with the little lady. So thank you very much for your time and attention and I hope you all benefited from that. Kate, over to you. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Fantastic webinar there and presentation. Um, as Martin said, apologies about the slight technical issue at the beginning there, but I don't think it took anything away from your presentation there, Martin. Um, there's no questions there, so um, we'll we'll call that a day and wrap that up. If anyone does have any questions, please do get in touch and there will be a recording sent out of the video and of the presentation within the next 48 hours as well. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much and good night, everyone.